earnest and the grave is not its goal dust thou art to dust dreameth was not spoken of the soul not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way but to act that each tomorrow finds us further than today Art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating, funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead pass, bury the dead. Act, act in the living presence, heart within and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn or shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait the psalm of life. So that, that, that uh, poem represents what for you? Oh, are you interviewing me now? Mm -hmm. I think it's an inspirational moment. I mean, the idea of, of acting in the living present and being up and doing, these things resonate with me. I mean, that's the poetry of my childhood. I've had that around me all my life. Is that what's motivated you in your career? I, I suppose I was motivated by poetry since I was forced since a baby to learn poetry and I was able to have those thoughts in my head as I was proceeding and so yes I'd had these philosophical poetic concepts in me about being up and doing with a heart for any fate that's a fairly powerful thing to teach a baby. Do you think that somehow that influenced decisions, career decisions that you've made over the years? I'm sure it has. Can you give me an example? Well, I mean, one example is my decision to go to the University of Virginia when I thought that of all the schools who were writing me because I had good grades and I was a national achievement scholar and all that, that when I didn't hear from them, I decided I was going to go to them just because I figured they didn't want me there. <laughs> so it's the kind of spirit that makes you want to change the world. Did you feel any kind of um, uh, struggle inside to decide to go someplace where you thought they did not want you? I don't think I felt a struggle inside. I mean, I, uh, the way I tended to be and probably still am, I would think about it and I would say, boy, this is going to be hard. Oh, God, this is going to be difficult. Okay, I'm going to do it. And then I'm gone. I'm off and doing. I'd, I'd like to kind of work off of that theme a little bit and, and get you to tell me a little bit about your legal career when you, after you graduated from law school. Let's start from that point. I finished UVA and I come to Hunt and Williams. Now that was the only job I got. I may have mentioned this before. I applied to law firms all over Virginia, but the only job I got was Hunt and Williams. I come to Hunt and Williams and I think, because I'm living in a world of segregation and have, was raised in a world of segregation, and so I'm thinking, hmm, what should I do that will help advance my career in the law? And I think at that time, I'm going to learn something that hardly any other black person knows, and that's uh, the, the law that deals with, we represented at the time, Virginia Electric and Power Company. And so state utility law and state rate regulations for uh, utilities, there were just no black people near that area because you had to represent VEPCO to do that. And so I decide that I'm going to be a VEPCO lawyer. So I come to Hunt and Williams on what we call the VEPCO team. And I do these cases. I work on these very complex financings for the power company and the rate base information and capitalizing their poles, the power poles and generating stations and all that it was very advanced, complicated work. Well, anyhow, it was not that exciting to me. It was kind of dull in the office, doing math, reading charts, working with economists, 
preparing testimony that you would submit in writing. So there comes along in those early years the construction of the North Anna nuclear power plant, which is still there now, but this is 1975, 76 when I'm coming to Richmond. And they needed a lot of young lawyers on the case because it was massive. So because I'm on the VEPCO team, they give me to the litigators to work on the North Anna case, but I wasn't assigned to litigation. But I get there and I'm working on the mechanics of litigation. I'm out at the site looking at the problems and constructing the site. And we actually helped create the first computer program ever used in the country to, to uh, match up. We had to track every weld, W-E-L-D, that was in this nuclear facility because there were problems with the welding and we were suing this company for doing a bad job building this thing. But we had to be able to prove the problem with every single weld. And we developed this computer program where we could say one reactor cubicle C35 uh, section 2 well number 192 and this is the report for that well this is that all that so I work on that case and I become hooked on litigation and I switch from the VEPCO team through that case to the standard litigation practice in the firm and I was off and running after you transfer to this other litigation, of litigation mm -hmm. what kinds of cases, other cases, um, did did you work with, and did any of those cases take you before the Virginia Supreme Court? They did, as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, there's a case. Uh, uh, we would have the cases where people would come into contact with power lines, and they would be injured and sometimes killed, and so these cases happened all the time. And I was at the Supreme Court of Virginia on those kinds of cases along the way. But, it, you know, it, it, uh, th there were things, for example, like a, a black kid gets injured and I'm the lawyer against the lawyers for this black kid claiming against um, uh, VEPCO. I had situations down in Norfolk, Virginia, where Henry Howell, who had been Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, was a very powerful plaintiff's lawyer, and he had a case against VEPCO, somebody coming into contact with the power line. I get sent to Norfolk to litigate on my home turf against the very famous Henry Howell, and it was, you know, it, it was people thought it was a fairly deadly mission to. To be, I mean, the, the way people would say it was like being sent to hell with gasoline jaws. <laughs> that was a tough job to go to Norfolk to litigate against Henry Howell in his town on a sympathetic case. But those are the things I had to do. So how did you do in that case? I think we settled the case. But, I mean, it was fair. Well, I'm in court against Henry, and I had gone to school with his daughter, so he's like, an old guy, old enough to be my father and all that, and I'm up against him and we're grappling and going at it as litigators do. So you held your own? I did the best I could. So now, wh do you remember the first case you ever appeared before the Supreme Court? I can't remember the very first one. I, it, I mean, it's back 30 some years now. I know I was here, um, there, it, well, it may be the first one. There was a member of city council named Golding who turned out to have been a convicted felon who had not had his civil rights restored, which meant that he was not eligible to be elected to an office in any government in Virginia. But he had gotten, nobody knew, and he had gotten elected to the city council of the city of Richmond. And the problem was how to remove him from the seat. And so we brought a proceeding called Quo Quo Waranto, W-A-R-R-A-N-T-O, which means on whose authority do you hold office? And we bring this proceeding at, the, at first at the trial court in Richmond and then at the Supreme Court of Virginia to remove this man from office. And I argue this case. And so that was fairly early because I was an associate at Hunt and Williams and so this would have been 75 up somewhere around 1980 maybe 79 or 80 so 
I'm sure that's the first time I argued at the Supreme Court of Virginia. Did you win? Yes, we won that case. And did you ever track how many cases you um, argued before the court? No, I, I've, I've never thought to go back and do that. But you, you argue different things. You argue at the petition stage when you have a 10 minute, it used to be longer than that, uh, unopposed argument uh, just by yourself to urge the court to take your appeal. And then once that's granted, you come on for the argument on the full case. But I was here early enough arguing petitions that in the very early days, right now the court has what they call writ rooms, and these are little benches that three of the justices sit on. Then when the court was in another place, you actually went in and sat across a table from three justices who were not in robes, they were in their coat sleeves, and sometimes they would even take their jackets off, so it was like just the neatest experience to be a young lawyer sitting across the table from three justices of the Supreme Court explaining why they should take your case. It's, it's nothing like that anymore. But I did several like that. When did they stop doing that? They stopped doing that, uh, I don't know. It, it's just some, at some point in my time, they, I guess when they came to this building, they had the writ rooms over here and they started being on the bench and being more formal about that process. So was that during your tenure on the court? Oh no, they had started that before I got over here. They, they had gone to the writ panels and the writ rooms and being in robes, but very early, like 75, 76, 77, they would just sit across a table. So what, how, did you ever think that um, or envision yourself as being on the court at, at any point in these early years as a lawyer? No. Had you ever thought about becoming a judge, or did you just visualize yourself as an attorney? I never thought about I, I thought about being the governor. I never thought about being a justice. So it just it was a, not a thought I'd ever had. Now you said you thought about being governor. What did you want to do as governor? Well, I thought that I, I had thought, I mean, this is back to high school days. This is back to being in Maury High School. My classmates actually called me governor because they thought that I was going to be some kind of political leader. So I thought about it then. And when I was at UVA in a uh, uh, American government major, I thought about being governor of Virginia. Um, I don't think I had any particular thing I wanted to do to change the state. I did have the idea, which I got from the Kennedy era when I was a teenager, of the best and the brightest, trying to draw the best and the brightest people to serve in government. I had a sense like that, and I had a sense of having a government that had everybody in it. And I'm talking about a, an integrated, inclusive government. Is That's the most that I thought about it. So it sounds as if you had an attitude of service, even as a young Young I think that's fair. I mean, but that's not the kind of thing a person says about themselves. Others say that about you, but I think that's probably right. I mean, I'm out there, you know, trying to help. Mm -hmm. So now, I you told us earlier about Chuck Robb um, inviting you uh, or appointing you, I should say, to be on the court. But go back and tell us a little bit about that whole situation again. Well, it was. Uh, it, this it, I, I forget the precise moment in time. It, I think it was February, March, 1983. It has to be then. The General Assembly was in session. There was a vacancy on the Supreme Court of Virginia. The General Assembly was at loggerheads. The House had one candidate. The Senate had another. Each time they switched the name to the other chamber, the other side voted the name down of the other chamber. So they go out of session with no justice. So there's a vacant seat on the Supreme Court and the power to appoint on an interim basis shifts to the governor. At that moment, Rob is governor. He's uh, son-in-law of Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, of course, put Thurgood Marshall on the U.S. Supreme Court. People start talking about this is the chance to integrate the Supreme Court of Virginia. So there are letters to editors and there's commentary on radio and in the news, this is the chance to do this. And I'm away, I'm out of town, but as I, the story goes, Rob calls back. After he gets this letter, he calls. 
and the secretaries at the firm are running up and down the hall because he doesn't call through his secretary saying, oh, the, would you get somebody for the governor? Apparently somebody answers the phone and there's Chuck Robb on the phone, which is fairly startling to most people. This is Governor Robb. I need to talk to Alan Rudlin. And he gets Alan Rudlin on the phone and he says, I want you to bring Apparently, remember, I'm not around. I'm actually out of state. I was near Easter time, and I was somewhere with my family in another in Ohio. And bring his briefs, bring his writings, bring the managing partner, bring the chairman of the firm. I want to meet. I want to see all of you. And they have this meeting, and they talk about me. I'm not there. So then, Rudlin has a lot of influence with Rob. Well, they were moot court partners in law school. I mean, I don't know whether they remained buddies, but they knew each other. They, they knew each other very well because when you're moot court partners, you write briefs together, you argue together and all that. So uh, he was close enough to the governor to listen. And uh, do you know what, what he said to Rob um, in recommending you, what specifically he said? I have the letter, but I haven't looked at the letter in many, many years. But I, somewhere in my papers is the letter that Rudlin wrote to Rob uh, telling him. And then I don't know what was said in the conversations that all these people had. Mm -hmm. I'm told they were all given assignments like you go talk to the media, you go talk to the bar, you meet with somebody. And everybody had these assignments. Of course, I know none of this. So now. Once the decision was made, Rob needed support. So what happened at that point? Well, I mean, of course there are probably things he did that I don't know, but I do know that he made phone calls. I mean, I, I sat in his little office, the governor's office then, I guess it's changed now with the new capital, but then the governor's real private office was just this little teeny office, very small, stuck back uh, upstairs in the capital. And I sat in there with him as he called all over Virginia telling people that he wanted them to be the first to know that uh, he was appointing me to the Supreme Court. But you could tell he was calling community leaders and members of the General Assembly and people all over the state. And so after he appointed you, what kind of reaction did he get in terms of this decision that he made during his administration? I was told later by one of I think it was the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia who told me that uh, the polls after my appointment, but I don't think it was immediately after my appointment and swearing in and all that, there was a 70% approval rate among white Virginians for his putting me on the Supreme Court of Virginia, I am told. And this is, I've never seen a piece of paper, but this is what I was told. And that the approval rating among blacks were, was higher than that. So it was an astounding success, for this appointment. So it's fair to say that this was probably the most approved act that Governor Robb made or did in his administration? I believe that's what, what this statement to me was, that this was the most approved act of, of his governorship. Well, that's interesting. So once you got on the court, and we talked about how you like to write longhand, um, as you were writing your decisions and so forth, but I was just wondering, do you remember the the first your first day there? I remember it pretty well. I, well, let's see. the The first thing that happened was the announcement, the press conference at the Capitol, and I come out with the governor, and there are not all the justices, but the justices who were in town. I remember Chief Justice Carrico was there and Justice Compton was there. And there were a few others, maybe three or four, were sitting there. And he comes out and announces me. Well, not long uh, after that, I mean, maybe that same day, I come over to the court. I didn't, I didn't leave Hunt and Williams that day, but I, I come over to the court to, to meet the justices, and I remember being taken back to the robing room where, to my astonishment, there was a locker that already had on it Thomas J., which I thought was pretty cool. Well, now, these were people that you at least in some way already were affiliated, not affiliated with, but knew uh, because of the cases you litigated before the court. But I only knew them as a lawyer would know them. I, mean, I knew them 
having stood before them and argued and having sat across the table in writ panels and having submitted briefs and things of that kind. So it's not a real knowing, but that they had seen me before. They, they knew that I practiced at the Supreme Court of Virginia. So was that unusual for there to be a justice, so a, a person selected to be on the court who had actually litigated cases before the court? That happens, yeah, but I mean, the, the normal course uh, for being on the Supreme Court is coming up through the ranks of being a judge, and so it's not many times that a justice was never a judge before. I think Justice Cochran may be that way, that he was a, a member of the General Assembly and a lawyer who became a justice. Uh, justice Compton, for example, had been um, a judge, Justice Carrico had been a judge like that, so uh, Justice Stevenson had been a judge, and, and but I was one of a few who came right from being a lawyer to being a, a justice. Did you feel any kind of um, um, oddness or was the transition and the um, uh, conviviality easy to create once you were on the court? We had a pretty good time right away. We, uh, it, I, I, don't, I never had any strained relations. We never had any difficult time. We had fun uh, uh, right away coming on. Um, I had to worry. I had never done criminal law, so I, I worried about whether I could do criminal law, but uh, I found out fairly quickly that whereas civil law really bounces all over the place. That's all the disputes that people have, all of the range of problems that people have, all the interactions that people have fall under civil law, and so contract disputes and property disputes and all this, uh, it, it's a lot of complexity to that. But on the criminal side, the issues tended be, to be, not that they weren't profound issues, but they were about the same whether or not the criminal got his Miranda warnings, whether or not there was sufficient evidence on a s particular thing. And so just the way you had to handle the case, it, it fell into a, a, a more regular kind of pattern of what you were looking at. There was always a charge that the, the death penalty in Virginia was unconstitutional, but that came up every case and m that the, there was a failure to Miranda. That's almost every time. So you saw the same thing on the criminal side basically over and over. So once you got used to the pattern of the criminal cases, it was uh, more read, you could more readily uh, assimilate the law I mean, you, because you saw that law all the time. Now, how did you personally feel with a lot of these capital murder cases, um, especially in light of uh, uh, use of DNA to either uh, uh, confirm the conviction or to uh, overturn it. Uh, we were the first people to approve the use of DNA. This court, my court, was the first to approve the use of DNA in, in criminal cases in the United States. We were very early I in that. I mean, when I got here, there was no DNA. And so we, all the other things that you do, all the, the fingerprinting and all that is what you looked at. I never had a, uh, I never was generally opposed to the death penalty. I saw that people did utterly horrible things one to another, just atrocious crimes, mass murders, all that, and we confronted all of those things at the Supreme Court of Virginia. I was careful to apply the law, to do what it said, to, to look at all the elements that you're supposed to. There were a couple of times I dissented in death cases because I thought that, you know, we hadn't done all the things we were supposed to do, but there were times that I have both written to affirm and voted to affirm, but I was just in each case doing what I thought a judge was supposed to do, looking at the facts, looking at the law, looking at the, the bases that we use to decide whether somebody should face the death penalty. So. Tell me a little bit about the discussions that went on on the court with the, with the application now of DNA tests. Well, I mean, you know, it was new science at first. I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm 
I'm trying to remember the case that we we uh, applied DNA for the first time, but I can't remember. I'm thinking uh, the name Fry comes to mind, and, and then there was a, a case Spencer or Spence that comes to mind, but I think I don't have it right. But uh, we had to come to grips with the science, and, and there are cases about how you apply new scientific technology to the criminal justice system, whether it's approved by uh, scholars in the field, whether it's reliable and all these kinds of things. We went through all those analyses in first deciding to use DNA, but once you got there, you, you know, we got some comfort with the technology because they were telling us that, you know, this match is unlikely, you know, they're not, there's not one in so many billions of people who would have these markers and so forth and so on. So, so among the justices, who seem to be um, uh, among the first or the first to really get on board with the idea of using DNA? Well, see, it, it all came to us at once. It, it, came, it was a case where DNA had been used, and so it, there was no particular justice. That somebody was assigned to write that decision. It wasn't me. And so that justice had to delve, delve down into it, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a, it took time for us to get there. We had to all get there or not, and we all got there in one case. So there wasn't any real discussion going on among the justices about whether this is valid to use or not? No, because the way it comes up to a justice, it comes up in a case or controversy, and both sides present, and both sides make their argument, and then we vote <laughs> what we think. And so we voted that we thought it was a reliable, trustworthy technique that would help ferret out the truth. Was this a unanimous decision? I think so. I, I can't remember the specifics, but I, I don't remember anybody dissenting about the use of DNA. Now, when you were on the court, um, that was also the first time you were the, the first African American to be um, appointed to the court, but you also were there when the first woman That's was right. appointed to the court. Now, mm -hmm. tell me how, um, uh, what, what changes occurred? Um, because this had been an exclusive male club. For, yes, for, for the, a long since time. the beginning of time. Well, there, it actually did make things have happen different, but they're at a very basic level that I guess history needs to know about. I mean, the way the court was set up, it was for all guys. And so, for example, the restroom off of the conference room was a men's restroom, there was no other. And it had file cabinets in it, but you, you walked out of a door from the conference room into this other room that had sinks in it and filing cabinets because there was lack of space all the time, and then the restroom part. But it wasn't, nobody thought about uh, having a woman justice on the court. And so there were a lot of things like that, that just physical, I mean, the roving room was the same way. You, you come in and there's like a guy's locker room and then there's the restroom. <laughs> and there was no thought about what do you do. I, I often thought about uh, Chief Justice Carrico in that time because he had to oversee these physical changes in the building to accommodate the first woman justice on the court. How long did that renovation take? I don't remember. I, I, I don't. Remember. I didn't. I was not here much longer after. I was. The, if she, I think she comes in like eighty seven, eighty eight, and I'm gone by the end of eighty nine. So we, you know, there were some interim accommodations like the guys just stood in the hall, <laughs> and then there then there were other things that that were done, you know, more formally. So were there any? Um issues facing Justice Lacey when she came in, and I'm thinking in particular about perhaps justices who felt that this wasn't a woman's place? I never heard anybody say that out loud. No, no, nobody ever in my hearing said, uh, you know, a woman shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. Here's what I noticed, and I don't know whether the other guys noticed this or not. I tended to, because I was so much younger than everybody else, I'm 27 years younger than the next youngest one, I was used to having women in class well, through law school and working at Hunt and Williams and, you know, just in life, you, I was used to having women colleagues. And so I was used to talking freely and, 
you know, taking your coat off and all that. The other guys weren't. It, surely the the older, I mean, like Chief Justice Carrico and like those guys who were very much older than me, they just were from another time. And so, whereas in conference we would be very relaxed when we were sitting around the table. I mean, we're not joking and playing, but we were relaxed, and we our coats were off, and we're getting up, getting coffee, and we're walking back around, and we're just doing what you do in a group of folks who know each other working on hard issues. But when uh, Justice Lacey gets there, she couldn't know this because she wouldn't know the difference before, but the guys stopped taking their coat off. It was very much more kind of formal presentation. And whereas in, in the past, I used to tell jokes and crack people up and have justices falling out of their chairs laughing and things, but I remember uh, at some point I'm sitting there and the chief looks up and he thinks that I'm about to tell a joke <laughs> with Justice Lacey sitting at the table. And some of my jokes were pretty, you know, they were, they, they were like for a male locker room. And so he just gives me the eye, like basically you better not tell, <laughs> you, you better not tell one of your jokes in this setting. So I got the message and I didn't, and I don't think I, I don't think I ever did again. <laughs> now was she present when, um, during any of your um, lighter moods, such as um, an incident when you decided to speak with an accent as you were talking to other justices and I don't remember cases. her being there. That, that may have been before she was there. So you stopped teasing and joking after her arrival? I probably teased and joked more than anybody else, but I know that I was kind of given the eye and, and the cue by the Chief Justice that I better not be telling <laughs> the kind of jokes that I might have told before because the, the atmosphere became different. It's not that it wasn't open discussion about legal issues, but it was a little bit more formal at the table mm -hmm. than it had been when, you know, some of the guys would be telling limericks and I would be telling jokes and, you know, we would be trading stories and you know, things like that. And then it may have, after I left, it may have gotten back that way as the court evolved, but in that moment when it was the first black and the first woman at the table at the same time with a court that prior to that had been the all uh, white guy club, it just changed dramatically. So now, during this period from 1983 to 1989, were there any cases uh, that that uh, came before you, especially cases that you had to take a particular look at? Um, were there any that were especially difficult or especially interesting? I think, you know, there's a lot that's difficult in the cases that we do. I don't, I don't have any one that sticks out as particularly difficult because it was all hard work. We did have a very interesting case that was assigned to me. I believe his name was Weishop, if I remember correctly. It was the question whether a husband could be guilty of raping his wife. I don't know that I've talked about that before, but I had to write that case, and it, that, was, that was very interesting. It actually wound up getting back to the English judges and being talked about over there and so forth. But there had been this, the, the legal theory that husband and wife are one, that they are a unity. And so it was legally impossible under theory for a husband to be guilty of raping his wife, but we said otherwise in, in this case. So that was kind of cutting edge stuff. And then the decision in which we adopted the use of DNA, that was very cutting edge. So were these the, uh, I know you said that the Virginia Supreme Court was the first to do the DNA. Was it also the first to rule that uh, a husband could rape his wife? I don't, it, if we weren't the first, we were, it, it may have been one other case in the country like that. We, we were very early, it, but, but I don't remember that being the first. I have some reaction that maybe New Jersey had said that uh, and then we said it. 
And you said that you found a very obscure English law? There, there was a, there were, that all the theory was that it was an English law principle that a husband couldn't be convicted of raping his wife, but as it turns out, there were English cases that I found that said if the wife had her own separate estate, if she came to the marriage, for example, with uh, a, a bounty or treasury that her father had bestowed upon her for her own sake, that, for example, in, in land, um, in, in the devisement of land, there was something called a, uh, uh, they were, there was entailment. And so you could have, you could give land to a female only, a female, or, or, to, or to a male only. And, and, and a woman with her own separate estate, for whatever the theory was, could in some situations be deemed different from her husband and not fall under this unity theory. So I think I found those cases and used those cases to point out that the fiction of unity was never absolute, even in the English courts. This is a kind of an interesting approach that you took. Do you think perhaps that your perspective help to then frame you going and digging and looking at these other cases? I don't think it was any perspective. I guess it's just my training. I mean, that's what you do. You, you turn over every stone. And uh, I'm sure these cases were discussed in the briefs. The, the lawyers would have brought this up. The lawyers who were saying that the man could not be guilty of raping his wife, they would have invoked the English cases. But the, the trick of it all is to drill down in the authorities that are cited and then see whether something came off of the cases that were cited. That's, that's what you really do when you're grappling with it. Uh, you, you might start where the lawyers send you, but then you would do independent research. You would keep going until you felt that you'd covered all the work. But that's less perspective than just the training in my life. Mm -hmm. Were there any other cases that you were uh, particularly intrigued by that you recall? Not really. I mean, you, the thing of it is the cases are coming at you a mile a minute. I mean, there are thousands of petitions for writ, which are cases, because when we say no to a petition for writ, that's a merits decision from the Supreme Court of Virginia. And so you had lots of those, and you had lots of granite cases. So. I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the cases and think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing jumps to mind as I sit here right now. So well, how many hours were we talking about a, on average a day? Were you working? It was untold. I mean, I, I actually thought about, you know, lawyers in firms keep time sheets because you charge by the time you spend, but a justice doesn't do that. But I always thought it might be interesting for me to do that, but I was basically reading all the time at home and, uh, you know, on ro on the road, on trips. I had briefs. I had a big bag and had briefs with me all the time because you had the reading schedule, getting ready to come on the bench to hear argument in the granite cases. You had the reading for the writ panel cases. You had the readings for the assigned cases to you in which you had to draft a decision. So it's constant reading. And then when you're the first black and youngest justice in the history of Virginia, you get invited all the time to make speeches here and speeches there and be on programs here and programs there. So, so you really had no life. Well, I think I had a lot. <laughs> well, how often did you um, have vacation time? Never. I mean, there was no, there was no get. I mean, we had a summer break. We had a summer break where you weren't at court all the time, and so it's not that I never went anywhere, or never did. But over the summer, you you wrote your de decisions that would be handed down when you got back in September. You just had a longer than normal time for writing your decisions when you did it uh, over the summer break. So there was always something to do. And if you lived in Richmond, as I did as a justice, if there are emergency matters that come up, you would be called because you were close by. So uh, the, the court recessed when, in June? I think that's right. Last session is June, and then it comes back September. 
And so during that period, this was the period when the justices were writing decisions, trying to get a little rest, but in your case, you were um, making speeches as well as... Yeah, all that. (laughs) So what kind of um, time did you have with your family? I had I had time with the family, but they think not enough. I mean, my babies were born in that time. All my children were born while I was a justice of the Supreme Court. So the first I was here, what, 83 to 89. One child was 84, 86, 87. So w- there were little babies crawling on the daddy's feet. Uh, eat, well, one of my babies I brought into the courtroom just sitting up on the bench and and my baby pushes the security button and makes the guards come running into the courtroom. <laughs> and he just sees as a baby would, he sees this red button. Bee <laughs> So now it, what was that like as a young father having this incredible workload? I didn't know any different. It it wasn't any it, the workload at the Supreme Court and the workload at Hunt and Williams was not any different to me. It was so, I, I was going to be reading and writing no matter where I was. And what about your wife? Did she have uh, her career at that particular time? Or no, she, she w- we were able to. We could afford it for her to be at home and be the mother, you know, not having a job outside the home. I, I was taught very early to say that because she had a real job, but it just was not a job outside the home, but there were these three babies in every size crib and every size diaper going to all the things babies do and being photographed. I mean, they've been kind of in pictures with governors all their lives. That's how they came up. (laughs) Well, um, I have a few other questions I wanted to ask, and then we're going to kind of uh, talk about some recent events. we talked the last time about you um, having to leave the court your health for health reasons, mm-hmm. and I was just wondering, um, what um, uh, what were some of the things that you did? I would say in your post court career. Well, I went back to Hunt and Williams, and I, and at the time th- there was a self imposed. There was no rule on the books, but I worked on appellate matters, but I didn't come back to appear in court for several years. And so when I go back, of course, everybody wants my opinion on what about this, what about that. So so I'm editing briefs. I do what I, I did what I do now. You know, I'm uh, opining on the approaches to take in cases and the issues to preserve and all that. So you were working in some way with the court still? No, I was working with the lawyers at Hunt and Williams. Okay. And, and with, when an appellate matter was coming up, what do you think these the issues ought to be? How do you think we should present this? What do you think we should say? What do we should we do? All that. So, have you had to litigate any cases before the court since your departure? Oh yeah, I come back to the Supreme Court of Virginia often on appellate matters here. I mean, many times. Uh, I don't go back to trial court. I've been back to trial court maybe once since I left the Supreme Court of Virginia. Uh, but I find that it's a better use of my time. I'm, I, we don't have specialty practices in Virginia. We don't have what some states have that you specialize in things and you can say that you're a specialist in things. But what I do is appellate work. Is that unusual for a former justice to then um, uh, appear before the court after retiring? I don't think so. I mean, I was so young that for others it just, it, it wasn't likely to happen because they were so much older than me that when they finished being on the court, you know, they were at the ends of their careers in general. For me, coming here at 32 and leaving at 39, I still had a lot of time left to try to take care of family and put children in school and all that so I had to keep working so this is what I know how to do but yes I've been back many times to this court. Has that been in any way awkward? 
I don't think so. It, it is. I don't see them away from here. I don't hang r hang around with the justices. So, so I'm not pals with the justices as I was in my time on the court. So there's a distance between us, which is necessary. Mm -hmm. But I come back to argue the cases like anybody else, and I think if, I think that if anything happens, I get the reverse of for having been here. I get beat up real bad. And I don't know whether I get beat up real bad because they want to show everybody we're not taking anything from this guy who used to be here. But my perception is I get the tough questions and get pushed around, and, which is fine, but that's just my perception of it. Now, you were the one who started asking a lot of the tough questions early on. So is this kind of a tit for Yeah, tat? turnabout is fair play and all that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now you'll remember that when I came on the court, the bench was not what they call a hot bench. The, the justices would go a long time and not ask questions, and I wasn't used to that in my training, and so I asked a lot of questions, and yes, I get it now. I get, <laughs> I get it for real. <laughs> <laughs> were there any justices when you were on the bench that you were particularly close to? Well, let's see. I was close to the chief. I was close. Yeah, we, but we were all very close. Um, so I don't think it's any particular, I mean, some were funnier than others. I mean, Roscoe Stevenson was probably a really, really, one of the funniest guys with the stories that he had to tell. Um, Charlie Russell was in that crowd, too, with his limericks and things. Um, the chief was very formal on the bench, but we had a good time off the bench. But that was his job. I mean, he we called him Great Stone Face. He's sitting there with the stopwatch trying to keep everybody straight and keep the time straight and all that. So, so but we had a, a, a really, we had dinners together and things at the justice. I guess they do that now, I don't know. But every, it, once every seven times, in other words, rotating through the justices, each time we met a justice had to be responsible for entertaining all the other justices. And and w is that what, selecting a place to eat right. or, okay. But of course I had taken a, uh, I had taken a fairly serious pay cut to be on the Supreme Court and I couldn't afford to take them out to restaurants so I would do it at my house. I would, I would we would uh, entertain at home and make dinner at home and so we would have basically family dinner at my house. Now, you, you mentioned that you had to take a, a severe pay cut. How did that um, impact you? Um, and and w I guess what I'm trying to say is um, uh, you were a partner mm -hmm. at Hunton and Williams, and all of a sudden you're now on the state payroll. Mm -hmm. What kind of tax reverberations did it, you face? Well, it, it was a big the, the tax. The, the tax issue comes from the fact that the firm was a partnership on a, on a different, uh, our partnership year and the tax year but and, and, the, and the federal tax year were not the same. And so that meant that I would generate money at different times than the end of the year schedules and such. So basically when I left uh, Hunter Williams to come to Supreme Court of Virginia, I realized a lot of income uh, at one time, which made me owe taxes on them. And then I was taking a very big pay cut, a third of what I had, you know, down more than a third of what I w had been making. So it was fairly serious. I had to make loans to pay taxes to be on the Supreme Court of Virginia in that day. Did you know that you would be facing this? Oh yeah, I knew that, but I, I didn't think I had, I didn't think I had a real choice otherwise. I, I f knew that this was an historic moment in Virginia. And I had gotten word that, listen, if you don't take this assignment, it doesn't look like there's going to be a black person on this court anytime soon. And you, now, the, 1983, if you don't do it now, this may not happen until another century is gone. And so I felt the kind of pressure of the historical moment. Why do you think people told you that? I guess the people calling me wanted me to do it, and so <laughs> they were let they were letting me know. Listen, this is the moment. Seize the moment. Why do you think they thought Rob was the only or last one to be 
willing to do something? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what they were thinking about who was coming along and all that. I mean, it, it might not have been true, but I guess the people looking at it at that moment figured we have this man here now. He may do this. If, if he does it, it's done. If he doesn't do it, it becomes uncertain whether the court will be integrated anytime soon. So basically what I was hearing from people were like, you got to do this. Come on now. We, we've got to get this done. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'd like to ask you, um, over the years, have there been any lawyers or justices um, who've really influenced your practice of law, your perspective of the law, or of your life's career? Well, I'm, you know, as we sit here now, uh, Oliver Hill died not long ago. And of course, when I got to Richmond 32 years ago, Oliver Hill was a very famous Virginia lawyer of national prestige who had fought in the great civil rights cases uh, in the 50s and coming on through the 60s in Virginia. And I got to meet him as a young lawyer. And I, I'm introduced to him in his law office and people say, you know, this is John Thomas, he's the first black. At, Hunt and Williams and Oliver Hill, uh, y young man, uh, good job, good show. Yes, sir. <laughs> and so I'm coming to attention for this old warrior, and I'm proud to meet him. And, you know, folks are telling me, you know, he was back on the city council in the 40s. He was the only black and all that. So here was this heroic figure that I got to meet uh, early on. Uh, Henry Marsh was very active in those days. He was mayor of Richmond back in that time. And, there were some Kate lawsuits I did for the city of Richmond back in the time that he was mayor. So the community had a lot going on. I mean, Doug Wilder was here, and he was a lawyer at the time, and then became lieutenant governor, and then became governor of Virginia. So here in Richmond, there was just a lot happening. Um, there were heroic figures. Uh, there was a great deal of political involvement. There was basically what young folk, really, I guess I say young people, what we would have said, there was a lot of action uh, in, in Richmond coming through here starting in the 70s when I got here. Did Oliver Hill ever tell you any of his uh, state Supreme Court stories? No, I don't remember him talking about being, see his practice tended to, a lot of his practice was in federal courts. So I can remember stories about him being in front of judge marriage in federal court, but I don't ever remember any stories about cases at the Supreme Court of Virginia. Has, um, what was, um, since you had a chance to really interact with him over the years, mm -hmm. what were some of his perspectives, if you recall, about Virginia legal system? I don't remember him talking about the system itself. I remember Oliver Hill talking about just how hard the struggle is, just how tough things were and how people didn't have money to pay him and, and you know how they had to keep going anyway and the sacrifices he had to make in his life. That's, that's what I remember about him. I remember uh, my abiding reaction uh, now and, and when I saw him getting all the great accolades like the Presidential Medal of Freedom and things of that kind, I, my, my, my reaction uh, then and now was, that, okay, look, all this stuff is great, but people just don't know how lonely and scary and dangerous it all was when he was out there kind of by himself coming home late at night with threats over his head. People were going to kill him. And, you know, his wife told me she would sit outdoors on the back stoop with the light on, waiting for her husband to come home so she could help in any way she could. Nobody was going to hurt him if she could help it and all of that. And I just, uh, my reaction was, this stuff is hard. The, the, the struggle to change society, this stuff is hard. And you've got to be brave. You've got to be courageous to take on systems that have injustice embedded in them to make them become anew. Do you think that um, when, um, when you were on the court and 
you all were sitting down and looking at some of these cases, some of which involved perhaps discrimination, or at least that was the argument. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that um, that everyone was aware that this was a changing society and that they had to really th look a little closer at uh, their decisions? Was there any change, or did you feel a sense of change? Well, I'm sure I spoke up. Uh, I don't remember any discussions like, you know, things are, are different now. I, I, I just remember very frank discussions. I, I know that we, it, you know, we just really got down to brass tacks. And I can hear myself saying, but I'm not thinking about a particular case, but we would say things that's not fair, that's not right, that's not just. I mean, the justices would actually ask from time to time, what is the justice of this situation? Basically, what's the right answer? What do we need to do? How, how can we grapple with this problem? And every now and then, you know, the, the law is so complex and sometimes contradictory, we would come to a place where we thought that we were kind of tied up in knots in the law and one of the justices might say, well, look, we're just gonna have to hit this matter chest high and knock it down. Or another justice might say, we're going to have to just cut through this Gordian knot and get to the justice of it. So there was this sense. Uh, but, it, you know, it wasn't like uh, Virginia has changed. It was just a sense of justice that emerged from the discussions that we had. And I knew that I brought perspectives that they didn't have. And I think people appreciated that. When you were on the court, and and I, I want you to go to 1983, and I want you to go now. What do you think has been the single most important change that has happened on the court? Well, I think the changes that I saw in the time I was there, the first black and the first woman on the court, were the watershed changes that continue now. The, the, the Chief Justice is a black person. There are several women on the court, I think three women on the court now. So the court has come to look more like Virginia, be more like our society. And that was the great thing because there you sit uh, behind closed doors grappling with great and important issues. And it is crucial in my view that we have the best minds with different viewpoints aiming at the problem to have the best chance at coming to the right answer, the just answer. So even in looking at the law, you believe that a person's perspective is just as important. That's absolutely right. I mean, it is in, indeed it is provable because, for example, segregation was the law of the land in the United States under the very words that exist in the Constitution today. It was the same Constitution and people at the highest court of the United States in a time read those words to mean it's okay to have black people over here, white people over there, black people this, white people that, the same words. And so the same document, the same law, the same words with different people, aha, all men are created equal. Mm. Wonder what that really means. Justice for all. Wonder what that really means. And somebody comes later and says, these words must mean everybody. And so yes, it is utterly critical that the people who administer justice reflect our society. When, the, when uh, Justice Lacey came to the court, do you recall anything that she said, any perspectives that she had that sort of opened your mind to perhaps a, a, a different view on something because she was a woman? Not just because she w had been a, a lawyer, but more so I don't remember that for me, but see, 
as I say, I was used to being in class with women and used to having women colleagues and women moot court partners and so forth and so on. And because I come up in the time of the civil rights movement and the and the search for the feminist rights and all that at UVA, and my time, I was kind of in the crowd already. So I can't remember her saying something that makes me go, "Oh yeah, I never heard that. I never thought of that before." And that might have been true for others. I don't know, but I don't remember anything like that. I mean, I was happy to have her there because I thought the court was more inclusive immediately for her perspective to be at the table. But a lot of times it's not like obviously like a black perspective or obviously a woman's perspective. It's just another perspective. It's just somebody says something that the others go, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And you can't tell listening to the comment where from that person's experience it bubbled up. You just know that you go, oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, I guess we should think about that. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. That's kind of the nature of the discussion. Mm -hmm. So now, at this point in, in time, do you think that the court has evolved and does not perhaps need to evolve any further in terms of inclusion? Well, there's no black woman on the Supreme Court of Virginia. I mean, these are the things that the politicians will get to uh, at some point. Uh, my cousin is the Chief Justice of Georgia, a black woman, and her court is black men, black women, white men, white women. Like, you know, her. when I look at the Supreme Court of Georgia, I see the, com you know, the, the more inclusive court than I see right now in Virginia. Virginia has come a long way, but I do notice that there's no black woman on the Supreme Court of Virginia. Um, what about the, the other um, ethnic groups, the Asians and, or Asian Americans mm -hmm. and so forth? This day is coming. I mean, you know, Virginia, the Virginia of my childhood is a black and white Virginia. The, the new Virginia has different large ethnic groups that were just not in my childhood. And so you have to forgive me for thinking in the way that I was born into, but that doesn't mean I want to leave anybody out. I am for having as many viewpoints at the table as we can. So if, if you were um, asked to perhaps write um, a comment or, or a thought about your experiences on the court, your experiences arguing before the court. What would you like to kind of leave for posterity? What thoughts? Well, my experience on the court, the thing I remember the most is that our discussions were very detailed, very bare bones, very down to the nitty gritty, as people might say. Nobody was holding anything back. I mean, to, to the point that some of them were really tough discussions, but I appreciated that, and I think the others who served in my time appreciated that, too. Standing in front of the court, it's, that's just the nature of being in front of it. It's hard, because you stand there <laughs> Uh, with points to make, but then you've got seven people with questions to ask, and their questions to ask probably are not all the points that you want to make, and you're under a time limit, and the clock is ticking, and the lights are changing, and you're trying to answer questions and get to it, and remember hundreds of cases sometime, and be able to go to a quote and go to some place in the record saying, that's really tough duty, and so I have to say, if I had to choose, I would rather be on the other side of the bench <laughs> asking questions <laughs> than being the lawyer in front of the justices taking questions. But I've lived both ways, and I can do both of them. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, there's a very beautiful poem by a man named Barrows, and he calls his poem Waiting. But I think his poem is better called Destiny because that's what it's about, and maybe that is the way to end. But he says, serene I fold my hands and wait, nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. I rave no more against time or fate, for lo, my own will come to me. I stay my haste, I make delay, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amid the eternal ways, and what is mine will know my face. 
asleep, awake by night or day. The friends I seek are seeking me. No wind can drive my bark astray or change the tide of destiny. What matter if I stand alone? I wait with joy the coming years. My heart will reap where it has sown and garner up its fruit of tears. The waters know their own and draw the brook that springs in yonder height. So flows the good with equal law unto the soul of pure delight. The stars come nightly to the sky, the tidal wave unto the sea, nor time, nor space, nor deep, nor high can keep mine own away from me. Destiny. Wonderful. Thank you.